Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode, and I'm so excited to introduce you to someone named Seam Land. It's spelled S-I-I-M, last name Land, and he has a website, seamland.com. And today we are talking about intermittent fasting and autophagy, and of course, losing weight. So welcome, Seam. Tell people a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, uh, you did say my name correctly, so <laughs> that's good to hear. Uh, but uh, it's a, it's an Estonian name, and I live in Estonia. So uh, what I do essentially is just uh, create content about optimizing your health, uh, longevity, fitness, and uh, that sort of things with different biohacking techniques that include intermittent fasting, exercise, taking saunas, <laughs> doing some cold exposure, and yeah, like everything else related. So I have like a website. Uh, which is essentially like a blog slash uh, article composition. And uh, I have a YouTube channel. And yeah, I've written uh, several books about uh, nutrition, ketosis, as well as uh, autophagy and uh, fasting. Wow. And Estonia, is that is that near Finland? Are yeah, you uh, kind of yes, uh, Finland? Uh, directly underneath uh, Finland. Wow, okay, great. Well, we're going to jump in and I'm going to just ask you a bunch of questions. So talk a little bit about how intermittent fasting helps with autophagy. Explain what autophagy is and how intermittent fasting really helps. Yeah, well, uh, autophagy is like this, uh, it translates into self-eating and it's this uh, physiological process where your body eliminates certain uh, pathogens, different dysfunctional cell parts, and just inflammation and uh, these different uh, aggregates that tend to accumulate there because of being either exposed to certain toxins or just uh, living in general. So uh, autophagy is this very intricate part of uh, healthy cellular metabolism. And there is some autophagy happening uh, almost all the time in different uh, degrees uh, but it especially increases during uh, energy stress, such as like fasting, uh, calorie restriction, exercise, or even saunas and those things, uh, they all promote this essentially like this cellular turnover uh, where your body starts to clean out the house uh, more rapidly and more uh, thoroughly. And uh, fasting itself is a way of kind of mimicking a lot of the benefits of uh, calorie restriction when it comes to uh, autophagy and other longevity mechanisms. So. Uh, color restriction is very beneficial for slowing down aging and just improving general uh, metabolic health. Uh, but the key parts of why this works has to do with uh, autophagy and several other uh, longevity pathways that get activated during it. And with fasting, you can kind of sidestep a lot of the negative side effects of calorie restriction, such as like malnutrition and uh, losing muscle. And you can still gain a lot of the beneficial sides of, the, of these uh, longevity. And uh, in a way, the intermittent fasting is also very beneficial for uh, the, the circadian rhythms and uh, your body's chronobiology. So your body is always kind of adjusting its metabolism based upon like the cues that it receives from the environment. And those cues can come in the, in the form of uh, light as well as food intake. So kind of confining your eating window every day with intermittent fasting, you can also uh, improve your uh, circadian alignment uh, with the environment. And uh, that again, actually supports or promotes the, uh, the functioning of, of autophagy. And again, like protects against the many, many of uh, these metabolic diseases that a lot of people suffer from. I love how you said, I read on your, on your website, you had said that a lot of people think that fasting is the F word, like don't skip a meal or else. And the truth is that eating three meals a day is really not good for you. It's deviant in nature. And fasting is what we should be doing. That's the norm. Us eating three meals a day should be, you know, that should be an exception to the rule if we're having, you know, we're on vacation or we're really kind of indulging that day. Right. I wouldn't say that it's harmful, but it's definitely like not, like not ordinary uh, for um, other species, especially as well as uh, humans in the past. So yeah, we didn't used to have like these very uh, planned out meals three times a day with snacks and etc. We were kind of experiencing uh, very 
you know, uh, random meal times. And sometimes we would eat only maybe once a day. Sometimes I would imagine we would have eaten maybe four times a day. And uh, sometimes we would have not eaten anything for like several days in a row. So uh, this sort of a puncture, this uh, kind of disruption in our balance and uh, disruption of this uh, habitual eating causes this positive uh, beneficial stress response that the body has to adapt to, so to say. Uh, it causes, it creates this, um, it's called hormesis, so to say, that where the, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And uh, that's how fasting also sh is supposed to work. You uh, disrupt this uh, homeostasis, you, you disrupt the balance that your body is constantly in. And uh, a lot of the time in the modern world, we tend to live in this very stagnant state where only we're not really experiencing deviations from the norm. Everything is just, you know, stagnant when it, in, in terms of the food intake as well as the temperature and in terms of the, like the physical movement, et cetera. We, we don't experience this uh, disruption where our body has to adapt to the new stress and uh, adapting to a stress is beneficial in small amounts. And it's definitely very useful for like increasing fitness and uh, protecting against, uh, you know, just general uh, degeneration. Um, so the, one of the things you talk about is losing weight with oxidative priority kept in mind. What does that mean? What is oxidative priority and what do you mean by that? Uh, yeah, o oxidative priority essentially means that there's a hierarchy of uh, fuel sources that the body uses. So there are many different kinds of uh, sources of energy that the body can tap into. And there is a certain hierarchy based upon the metabolic status, as well as like the particular physical conditions that your body is currently under. So for example, one of number one oxidative priority is actually alcohol. And because like alcohol itself is a, like a toxin uh, that the body tries to get rid of as soon as possible. So whenever you are intoxicated from alcohol, then the utilization of other fuel sources such as carbohydrates and fat decreases a lot and your body kind of starts to focus on burning the alcohol instead of the other nutrients. Uh, and the other other uh, nutrients are like protein carbs and fat that have a, like a lower priority and uh, fat has actually the least priority in in this particular order your body tries to you know uh, burn through its essential nutrients uh, or like it's it tries to um, use the essential nutrients first before it actually taps into its own body fat stores so that's why you need to actually be in like a calorie deficit in order to start burning your own body fat stores uh, you know because it's like a backup fuel it's it's supposed to be this energy store that you can deposit like in these vast amounts of calories and you only start burning it when there's actually like a necessity for it uh, but al also like during the exercise itself and the physical conditions you experience during the day, those, those will also affect uh, this hierarchy. So for example, if you're just moving uh, around the house, you're not you know, doing some intense exercise or you're just going for a walk, then your body is already burning primarily fat for fuel because the intensity is low and you have a lot of fat uh, that you can uh, store. On the contrary, if you're doing something like sprinting or that is intense, some weightlifting or go to the gym, then your body switches over to burning glycogen for fuel because uh, glycogen is like a backup fuel that is supposed, supposed to help you to run away from predators. And in that case, you burn more glycogen. So if you, have, if you keep these things in mind, then you can also kind of make adjustments to like the macronutrient ratios that you eat in a given day. So if you are very physically active, you do a lot of explosive workouts and this intense, intense exercise, then you're, uh, you can get away with eating more carbs as well. Whereas someone who is more sedentary, they, they don't burn through that much glycogen and therefore they don't need that many carbs either. They can, they can eat more low carb and a higher fat keto diet in that scenario because uh, their, their body is already burning through more fat during the day. Hey guys, I want you to know what I've been doing for my health that is absolutely transforming it. I'm taking massive amounts of vitamin C. Now, it's not just the regular vitamin C. This is 100% natural and it only contains natural sources, whole foods like amla berry, camu camu berry, uh, cherry. So it's literally just ground up fruits and massive amounts and it delivers 750% of your daily recommended vitamin C. 
So I literally double it and I have just seen so many benefits. So go to ChantelRayWay.com slash vitamin C to get yours today. Okay. So I want you, I want to make sure I understood what you said. So you said, so when you're doing intense workouts, you're going to be using more glycogen for fuel. And then you said, but when you're walking, you are using more fat for fuel. But, Mm -hmm. but here's the thing. It really, doesn't it depend on how much glycogen you have in your body to start with, right? So like, let's just say I have this much glycogen in my body, whether I'm doing walking or whether I'm doing intense, intense workout. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm not following what you're saying. Right. You well, just... well, like for, for, for example, um, you, you, can, um, you can do low intensity physical activity in a low glycogen state and still burn fat, so to say. It depends on the particular uh, intensity uh, of the exercise. And uh, there's a, like a crossover, a f- crossover threshold where, where you start to burn more glycogen as opposed to fat. And it happens around, like uh, for most people, it's around 65% of your VO2 max. So if you start breathing through your mouth, and you can't breathe through your nose anymore, then you switch over to burning uh, glycogen for fuel. And for, for example, even if you do run out of your glycogen stores during that intense exercise, or if you start doing intense exercise with very low glycogen and you burn through that glycogen, then the body still needs glycogen to carry out that physical performance, so to say. And uh, it can, it, in order to uh, achieve that, it's going to convert some of its own uh, amino acid stores or it's essentially it's protein and muscles is going to convert that into glycogen through the process of gluconeogenesis if your glycogen is depleted during the intense exercise uh, and in order to replenish the glycogen you need to either consume some carbohydrates uh, or just rest and recover so the, so the glycogen stores can replenish themselves even with fat but it, ha- it has to take like a longer period of time for uh, approximately like 24 hours of not doing anything to replenish that stores. Uh, but uh, y- you can't like directly take fat and start using that fat for uh, the intense exercise, even if the glycogen gets depleted. Oh my gosh, this is so huge. So I want to stay here for just a second because this is one thing that I just had a guy on our show and we were talking together and he was talking about how when he was going to the gym and he was doing high, high intensity workouts, like, like doing weights and then cardio weights and cardio, like an interval program. And, you know, he was doing intermittent fasting and he wasn't losing the kind of weight that he, he wanted to do. And then he switched and then he just started doing walking. He was like, I'm just, you know, and then he said that the, the exercise was making him eat too much because then he was just so ravenously hungry. So then he was probably eating more than he needed to. And then he switched and said, you know, I just moved to doing walking. And he's like, I started losing all kinds of weight. Right. So do you think that that is exactly what you're saying right here? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very common problem. Like people, uh, they do this uh, crazy hit hit programs where they're burning through a bunch of glycogen all the time. And they're also eating like a low carb diet and they're doing fasting and kind of piling these stressors on top of the, their body. And this leads to uh, losing their muscle mass because their body essentially burns through the glycogen and starts burning through the muscles as well. So uh, yeah, that, that's exactly like the problem. Uh, a lot of the times it's actually better to yeah, focus on uh, doing uh, resistance training, which is, which is like an intense form of exercise and it does burn through glycogen, but it's not, uh, you don't burn through the glycogen that much and you actually stimulate the muscles to uh, uh, promote protein synthesis and additionally, additionally increasing the lean muscle mass. So uh, with that, you can just essentially improve your body composition by burning through the fat and uh, also increasing lean muscle mass, which will increase your metabolic rate and makes fat loss easier as well. So yeah, like a lot of the times, it's not that you need to 
do more cardio and uh, spend more hours on the treadmill, a lot of the times you just need to actually do the right type of exercise uh, in the right dose and like at the right time. So do you, you know, this is kind of a big thing that people go back and forth with is on the fact that when you do, I've heard a lot of people saying you should do cardio in a fasted state. And they say you should not do resistance training in a fasted state. Can you comment on that of what is your opinion on that? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, it would depend on the goals of the person and their like preference. So uh, you, it is true that your rates of fat oxidation are higher if you exercise in a fast state, uh, but fat oxidation doesn't necessarily equal fat loss. So uh, fat oxidation just means that your body starts to burn more fat as a fuel source. Uh, like I said earlier, in, in, in regards to the oxidative priority, so you're gonna raise the amount of uh, fat that is being transported into your mitochondria, basically, and how much fat are you burning. Uh, but in order to still lose fat uh, from your body fat stores, then you have to be at a calorie deficit over the course of the entire day. So uh, it's, it does promote, like it, it can improve how much fat are you burning during exercise, but whether or not you're going to end up losing body fat depends on, you know, what you do afterwards and uh, how much food are you eating. So it's not going to give you like this free pass or it's not going to give you this uh, get out of jail free card uh, in terms of that. Uh, but it's just going to may maybe shift the, uh, the oxidative priority a little bit. Uh, but when it comes to resistance training, then uh, doing resistance training in a fasted state will be more catabolic, so to say, it's going to be more damaging to the muscles and you may lose more muscle because of that. And uh, that in turn, if you do it all the time and chronically and you don't compensate for it, then you may just lose muscle mass and that can just lead to uh, suboptimal uh, body composition and, uh, and that sort of thing. But you can definitely prevent that by making sure that you eat enough protein uh, afterwards and uh, getting enough calories as well, so to say. So it's not like a black and white thing that if you work out fasted, then that's going to equal muscle loss. But mo a lot of the times, uh, let's say, if you want to fully optimize your performance and strength development, then ideally it would be better to have like some, some uh, especially protein before working out because uh, protein is going to be the one that protects against the muscle catabolism that happens uh, during the workout. So uh, yeah, it's a maybe for people who are doing some form of intermittent fasting, then it's a good practice to maybe, I don't know, do some walking, go for a long walk in a fasted state before they eat their first meal, and uh, then then do the resistance training after they have eaten something. So they'll say so that they will actually be able to push themselves harder. Okay, so what is the difference between fat oxidation and fat loss? Uh, yeah, well, uh, like I just said, the fat oxidation just describes the process of uh, how your body produces energy at a particular moment, like what kind of fuel substrates are being used to uh, generate ATP in the mitochondria. So the ATP is uh, the energy currency that is used for all of these uh, physiological processes. And you can generate ATP from many things, such as oxygen, such as glucose, uh, fat and other other fuel substrates they can all all create uh, ATP and if you are using fat for producing ATP then that's fat oxidation basically you're burning fat uh, but uh, f fat burning would a lot of people just use fat burning as a way to describe fat loss as well but fat loss is that you're losing body fat so to say you're losing the body fat in your in your body fat stores so it's kind of different from fat oxidation you can you can be in ketosis and not lose any weight uh, by having high rates of fat oxidation but not losing uh, body fat because you're eating too many calories so fat loss is governed still by the calories and uh, energy balance you can't you can't overeat calories so to say and still expect to lose weight 
Hey guys, I have a free smoothie book that has over 20 recipes that are super unique, like broccoli bonanza, great green smoothie, and mojito madness, and so much more. They are really amazing and you're gonna love them, and the best part is it's totally free. So go to chantelrayway.com slash free recipe, and you'll get the book and tons of other free recipes. Or just look in the show notes and click there. So let's talk about, I would say, the number one thing question that I'm getting lately from people, obviously, you know, this intermittent fasting podcast, a lot of people are losing weight. And so let's pretend that they have 60 pounds that they want to lose. They're losing 30 to 40 pounds right away. Like they're doing, you know, a six hour window. They are eating what they want, but they're just dropping 30, 40 pounds. Now they've still got 20 or 30 more to go and they can't seem to, they, you know, they're, some of them are like, you know, I'm working out, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I cannot lose that last piece. So what would you say are some, like if someone just wanted to lose that last 20 or 30 pounds, what would be your suggestion for them? Talk about like what their workout would be, what their eating window would look like. What, what do they need to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I think um, if a person is already working out, then uh, in adding like a few additional cardio sessions uh, would, be, uh, would be beneficial because it's essentially going to make them burn more calories during the day. And uh, even it doesn't doesn't have to be like a specific cardio workout. It can be just walking in general. Uh, you know, walking uh, increases the amount of steps you take per day, and this is this is essentially like burning calories. So any any way you get more movement into a day can be beneficial for breaking a plateau. And the, one of the problems is also that as you lose weight then you may start to subconsciously move less because your body wants to preserve energy. So kind of setting a goal for yourself of how many steps you take per day is a great way to just keep yourself uh, more accountable and consistent. So, uh, you know, I myself, I always aim to get like at least 10,000 steps a day, but on most days I still get like 12,000 or 13,000 or something like that. So it's just a good good milestone to aim for every day. Uh, Secondly, I would also... Uh, I, I would also uh, encourage uh, to increase like their protein intake because a lot of the times uh, people tend to undereat protein and uh, higher protein diets in, in almost all cases lead to better body composition. They're going to inc- encourage muscle growth and also fat loss. So protein also protein has like the highest thermic effect of food, which means that your body expends more, more energy for digesting protein and you're wasting more more calories for digesting it. And uh, yeah, higher protein diets are also more satiating, so you'll just feel full faster. And they also help you to build muscle. So if you have more muscle tissue, then you'll start to burn more calories at rest without doing anything. So higher protein diets tend to be uh, better in, in almost all cases. And they don't cause any negative side effects uh, for most people, unless you have like some serious kidney disease or something so they're they're pretty safe uh, for uh, almost all people uh, and lastly i would also look at general stress management so to say because uh, stress can just lead to uh, uh, subconsciously eating more calories as well as just being uncontrollable with how many calories you want to eat so stress makes you raise more uh, or release more cortisol cortisol also promotes slight insulin resistance and it can also just make the person uh, want to eat uh, more calories. So I would, those, those will be the three things that, that I think uh, some people can use. And for women, <clears throat> what is a eating window that you're saying that people, you're seeing people really lose weight on? Um, I think uh, the, the standard, the average or the golden, golden rule would be to try to do the 16 and 8 fasting where you fast for at least 16 hours and eat within eight hours. So uh, there's no like a huge reason to be doing any longer than that. But some people may just prefer to either, you know, change it up a little bit by eating only maybe within six hours or less or something like that. That would be like just their own preference. But uh, 16 and eight would be the golden, golden um, 
rule for me, I think, uh, that, that aligns with the circadian rhythms and just uh, gaining some of the benefits from the fast state as well. Gotcha. So for me personally, when I did an eight hour window, I didn't lose weight. So I had to bring it down to a six hour window for me to be able to really lose weight. Mm -hmm. I felt like I just needed that extra time for me to really be able to kind of shed the weight. Right. I did like six hours and sometimes even less. Sometimes I only ate one meal a day or only yeah. in four hours. Um, so as far as eating tell us what, what does your eating window look like? What does your exercise regime look like? What does your eating window look like for you personally? Uh, yeah, I, I personally, I do like, um, it's, it's, a, it's like one meal a day, but with a slight nuance. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, I don't, you know, working out in a fast state can lead to more muscle loss and that's not my goal. So you should never want to lose muscle. And uh, that's why I, I actually consume like a protein shake during the workout and it kind of mimics like an actual meal. I'm getting sufficient amounts of protein to protect against the muscle loss that happens during a workout. And I'm still able to progress, uh, which would also help me to get stronger and build muscle tissue. So, uh, yeah, it's like a one and a half meals a day, <laughs> uh, something, something like that. And, uh, yeah, usually my workouts tend to be primarily with resistance training. Uh, I, do, I do go to the gym maybe once a week, but on most days I'm doing uh, like calisthenics at home. So uh, that's, that's my uh, preferable w way of uh, working out. And in my, in my post-workout meal, I eat sufficient amounts of protein uh, with like uh, meats, eggs, and some vegetables, and uh, some, uh, some healthy fats with some tubers as well. So kind of, kind of like a low-carb, low higher-protein diet with uh, one meal a day. Hey guys, I don't know about you, but if you are just feeling so tired throughout the day and just feeling restless at night, then I want you to try something called Energy Bits. Each package is has spirulina or chlorella algae. They're plant-based and they have zero sugar, 40 nutrients, five grams of protein. And so you are gonna feel great taking them. So go to energybits.com and then you'll get 20% off if you put the promo code Chantel. That's C-H-A-N-T-E-L. So then, so what time do you work out? Uh, it's in the afternoon. Okay. S some, somewhere around uh, 4 or 5 p.m. So you work out around 4 or 5 p.m. And then right after you, so you're not eating anything during the day then. So you're work. so all during the day you're waking up, you're not doing you're not doing any kind of workout or eating, then you wait, you'll work out at four, then you're having a protein shake and then you're having dinner. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's about right. Yeah, like I do go for walks during the daytime to, uh, you know, get the sunlight and to get some fresh air and also like get my steps in. And uh, I may, ha the only things that I do consume during the fastest state are, you know, teas, water and uh, black coffee. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. So I work out in the mornings, like early in the morning. So I might have to try that a couple times to see how that works. So just wake up in the morning, eat in it, you know, just don't eat anything. Don't work out. And then are you eating any, are you having that protein shake you're saying while you're working out? Uh, yeah. Like in between sets, so to say. Just uh, So basically you're eating one meal and a shake each day then basically. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. And that's how you're feeling the best, like the optimal performance. Uh, yeah. Like, um, I, I, I have, I've gotten like adapted to it, so to say. So initially it can be definitely, uh, somewhat more difficult, but currently I don't feel any different. So to say, I, I don't feel, I don't feel tired. I don't feel that I don't have energy during the daytime, et cetera. So I can still, still, uh, perform and uh, get my things done. Now, what are you, do you have an aura ring or do you have any things that you kind of say, here's some of the things I love to use? Do you have any like of your favorite products that you love? Yeah, I do use the, the aura ring. So uh, that's like a, one of the best uh, sleep darkers that I know of. And yes, yeah, very valuable for yeah, getting, yeah. <laughs> getting, getting information about sleep 
uh, as well as just the heart rate variability and uh, basal heart rate. So they're very kind of valuable uh, on, on a daily basis. Uh, other things that I like to use are just uh, the, like the blue blocking glasses, especially in the evening, so that uh, you would start to wind down and uh, start producing melatonin, the sleep hormone, and you kind of fall asleep better. So that, that would, I think uh, that's a good combo for if you want to optimize your sleep, then getting like an OR ring and uh, the blue blockers, then they're, they're really good. That's awesome. Any other products that you just kind of, what are you using to track your steps? Uh, well, the OR ring has a step, step tracker as well. So you're getting like the amount of steps. So I'm, I'm using that. <laughs> Using that to track your steps. Yeah, I, I, the one thing that I love, like I don't wear jewelry. I don't, I'm obsessed with this aura ring. It's amazing. <laughs> I like, it's one of my favorite things. Cause I don't like the watches It just gets on my nerves, but I feel like the ring, I don't even hardly notice that it's there. Yeah. And it's just, I, every morning I wake up, I literally check my sleep to see how much sleep I'm getting. How much <laughs> sleep are you getting each night? What's your scores looking like? Um, I think my, well, I get, I sleep about seven hours, seven, seven to eight hours every day. And my scores are around like 80, somewhere around there. Um, my deep sleep is pretty high. Like usually it's uh, two to three hours, uh, but my REM sleep is slightly lower around like one, one hour to one and a half hours uh, on most days. Awesome. I love that. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, my website is seamland.com. And uh, on all the other social media platforms, I'm also seamland. So yeah, pretty there's, pretty. there's only probably one in the world, right? You're probably the only one. We'll see. Well I, well, I think maybe a few more Estonians are with the same name, but uh, not definitely not out, outside of Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at ChantelRayway.com. We'll see you next time. <laughs>